everyone, welcome to another action-packed episode of ARG Presents. I am Amigo Aaron, joined this week by the notorious, nefarious, and hilarious Brent Dowdy. Hey, really? how's it going? What's going on, man? I have decided to take my rightful place by your side. Oh, jeez. We're off to a bad start today. <laughs> so, John is on assignment this week, and will be popping by occasionally, but it looks like for the foreseeable future this will be your ARG presents lineup uh, next week we're going to try some uh, a different approach and we're going to kick off with a very interesting choice but that's next week let's talk about this week oh this week yes. oh boy well before we get to the fun I want to do something we have never done on ARG presents this is a week of first we're going to look at some feedback from our last uh, game uh, or system in this case, which was the BBC Micro. We get the Gamble Tron out here. So we actually got some interesting feedback uh, from a couple fellows that actually are pretty intimate with the BBC scene. Uh, this first guy, uh, Lurkio Stardot, is the fellow that actually uh, has a minor role in maintaining the site bbcmicro.co.uk, which we use to play all the games. He's got a real nice guy. And uh, has a long uh, and detailed account of BBC uh, history and some other stuff that's very interesting. If you want to go over to last week's show on the YouTube channel and check it out, it's in the comment section. It's very interesting. We appreciate him uh, signing in. Uh, the other fellow that signed in, and this is also, I thought this was quite interesting, was a gentleman uh, named Richard Broadhurst, who not only did he provide a little bit of uh, interesting knowledge, uh, about the BBC Micro. He also uh, actually was one of the fellows that programmed for it. And he actually awesome. he programmed a couple games that we mentioned last week, uh, including uh, Phoenix, which was a great uh, game. He also did Frogger. And he mentioned to me that Phoenix wasn't even finished, which was impressive because I, I played it. I thought it was really good. Huh. So if you if that interests you at all, uh, you should check, uh, check. Again, this is a comment under our, uh, our last week's YouTube video. But it was a Pretty interesting week for feedback. These guys were much more knowledgeable about the BBC Micro than me and Boat were. But uh, all in all, we had a real fun time with the Micro, and hopefully someday we'll get we'll get to do that again. So, with that in mind, if you tuned in last week, you uh, saw us spin the wheel. We made the deal, and this week we'll be playing games on the oft overlooked Atari Jaguar console. There it is um, in all its glory. In all of its glory. So, Brent, have you ever owned an Atari Jaguar? I have door? not. Uh, in my growing up days, I took the Nintendo path and did all things Nintendo. So, the Jaguar was uh, too expensive when it first came out for me, since I was still living under parental money control. Uh, and then, by the time I got to the point where I could purchase my own Jaguar there was no Jaguar to purchase yeah they went from ex they went from and not super expensive to please buy these to we're gone very yes. quickly it was a quick descent so let's talk about the Jag a little bit uh, uh, this was again it was from Atari and it was manufactured get this you know who manufactured the Jag I which I'd heard this but it's weird, weird to think about IBM manufactured manufactured the Jag for Atari um, Big company, so it's not too crazy. <laughs> right. So the uh, Jag debuted in North America November 23rd of 1993. Uh, i never forget their ad campaign, Do the Math. It was a thing over and over yes. and over. Do the Math. Uh, this was billed as the world's first 64-bit console, which that's a little fuzzy. Yeah, it's a lot if, fuzzy. If you get into the fact that it sort of had, dual, had two 32-bit processors that worked in conjunction. So it, that stuff wouldn't really matter if, if it could push out the jack that would make a 64-bit console look like a 64-bit console, but the, that was a, a difficult process for the jack. It didn't have a lot of games that screamed 64-bit. Yeah, this was definitely during the period where the bigger number got the glory, but uh, didn't quite work for the jack. Yeah, and the, there was a lot of competition when this came out, too. You, you still had the remnants of the uh, the, the uh, Genesis and the... Uh, and the uh, uh, and the Super Nintendo. You also had the 3DO. 
You know, you had some, you had some other well, players had, in the game. Yeah, you had the point. looming of the Nintendo sixty four, right? So, so Genesis or the Sega Genesis. This thing Saturn. just uh, it didn't it didn't come out at a good time. But then I think what Roy sunk it was just the the games. Which we'll, oh, they had very poor, very yeah. low quality. Yeah. So uh, this game, uh, this game console debuted in the U S. at a price of two hundred and forty nine ninety nine. So in today's money, four hundred and thirty one bucks. Yes. So it's it's certainly not the most expensive console. It was no at. Neo Geo. No, but, no, but uh, a few, few things are. But it was still, you know, people didn't ru- people weren't really willing to take the risk. Yeah, as it were. Uh, it also had a sort of a notorious uh, CD uh, unit that would strap on top of it, and uh, this thing is notorious because it all failed. It was a very poorly designed and made yes. unit that would fit on the top right here on the very top of this thing. Uh, you can see here we've got the Jag and the controller. The controllers for this thing are sort of like a... Um, they remind me of something that bridges the gap between the old style and the new style. And what I mean by that is you've got the Nintendo... Super Nintendo style control pad with the two the start and select. But then you've got... Uh, uh, you've got the three buttons here. Sort of like the original uh, Genesis controller had. Right. But then you've got the old school, which is the little keyboard you've got right here. The little keyboard. The pad. numpad. Now... Uh, it's like someone looked at the Genesis controller and looked at the Intellivision controller and said, "Yeah, we should combine these." Yeah. And that was a horrible idea. Um, it reminds me, you know, again, it's it's exactly right. They it come it, this comes uh, back from the the uh, Intellivision or or ColecoVision days, or even uh, some of their own consoles with the little keypad on, on the joystick. I believe the Atari Two Hundred had that. And it's, you know, I always thought having a little keypad is a good idea. I mean, if you think about it, the the uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Xbox 360 had a little attachment you could you could stick on the bottom with a little keypad. Tremendously on it. different. Well, I, that yeah. was made for it was a keyboard and it was made for messaging. Uh, back right, and right. Forth. but I mean, it's, it's it's an idea that's been called upon a few times. I guess is what I'm saying. But you know why this kind of thing fails? Very simple. People want to be able to port things cross-platform, and you can't add in special buttons that make actual use of the keypad, and then go to a console that doesn't have that. It, it that's probably a problem. Although there wasn't a whole lot of cross-platform <laughs> game well, action on the Jag, but I guess that could have been a barrier. That, yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the the controller area right here also you could actually have overlays that would go over that. Um, you don't just see, like the Intellivision, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you don't see that all that often. Uh, I mean, people don't; those don't always make it when you buy a game. Most of my games were loose and did not have the uh, did not have that uh, little piece of plastic that came with it. Which is the Intellivision. It's funny they had a little they had a little thing in the in the box that would sort of you could slip those Slide in, it into you know? it, yeah. Uh, but uh, the Jags, the ones I've got, just sort of like just sort of set in the box. I don't like the box of the Jag either. That's a whole different story. So uh, <clears throat> unfortunately for the Jag, uh, it did not last long, uh, and it was uh, uh, out by '96. So that was a three-year yeah. cycle. And considering it came out in November of '93, that's basically two years. Yes. And if if you consider it was dying horribly by the, by that last year, you really had about a year and a half of actual production and quality time with the Jag. Um, the, you want to take a guess that the top selling game on the Jag? has to be Tempest 2000, right? No, it's not. It's the other big game on the Jag. Let's see if you can remember. It. Can you, no, it's, it's, it's beyond you. It, I will let the cat out of the bag. It was Alien vs. Predator. Oh. With, uh, which sold uh, which sold uh, 85,000 units. So that's, uh, that's a, it's impressive amount of units if you consider that the overall uh, sales on the JAG were somewhere south of 250,000 units. That's incredible. Wow. You know, that's an incredibly small run uh, of, of these things. Um, as if to kick the Jaguar's dead corpse, a few years ago, a fellow named Mike Kennedy purchased the molds uh, for the Jaguar and then put together something called the Coleco Chameleon mm-hmm. in the box. Now, I, I used to listen to Mike's show, and I don't, I've really had a problem with Mike. I always, thought, I always enjoyed Mike and, and the boys. 
uh, but uh, he decided to have his own retro gaming system and he uh, uh, took the molds and put together what, like I said, what eventually became the chameleon and it uh, uh, turned out to be fake. And it's sort yes. of notorious there. Also read that uh, these molds had been used before that in a dental office or dental equipment be put in the molds. I mean, actually, the Jags are kind of a cool-looking system. Oh, yeah. I, I thought, mean, it's... You know, uh, but... Very, uh, uh, very uh, timely. Yeah, I, mean, it's, I think it's a neat-looking system. So, with that background in mind, we selected two games on the Jag. And I'll go first this week, and I'll admit, I sort of had an ulterior motive when I picked my game because I wanted to do something that I had some experience on on another console or computer, and so, and also something I owned for the Jag. And so what I came up with was Pinball Fantasies. Now, if you listen to the sister show, Migos, uh, you'll recall that, gosh, way back, uh, we covered a lot of the pinball games on the, uh, on, the, on the system, including this one. And uh, it, the pinball fantasies, pinball dreams, pinball illusions on the Amiga are, are very, very, you know, popular games. Yes. And they're and they're good. They're good. They're really oh, sure. they, they sort of took pinball them and like you say, Epic took the pinball to the next level. Back when you know, when we came out of the realm of pinball in the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, and you know, even the Super Nintendo had its attempts at uh, pinball uh, with doing some table emulation. So. I thought I'd give Pinball Fantasies a shot. So this came out in <clears throat> this came out in the Jag uh, shortly after its its debut and was uh, uh, you know was effectively unchanged in a lot of ways from the uh, from the original Amiga version. Just to touch on it a little bit. So uh, this game was made uh, by 21st Century Entertainment on the uh, on the Amiga and. Uh, this was pretty much a straight port uh, to, to the Jag. Uh, the ta this thing had four tables that came on it. Uh, the, it had a billion, do billion dollar game show. It had... Roll the Bones. It had Party Land. Party Land, of course, is uh, your, your amusement park theme. Right. One. It had Speed Devils, right? Best it of had, the Bunch. It had Stones and Bones. So, Stones and Bones. So... Uh, Four tables for one cartridge, not bad. Uh, not not a bad deal. Now, so how are they? Um, well, I'm just going to go through these in order, because I've played, I played these a million times, so I'm pretty intimate with them. So Party Land, again, has sort of a, uh, uh, has sort of the atmosphere of a carnival or, or an amusement park. Yeah. Uh, I would say in terms of uh, something you would probably compare it to from an, that's an actual pinball machine, something like maybe Cyclone. That's what they're going for. Right, that now, feel. Is this, is this in the same realm as that? No. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> One thing you'll note, there are several there are things you'll notice about these games. For starters, uh, these came out on the Amiga. You know, Pinball Dreams came out, you know, in the in the in the early nineties, like like ninety nine one. This was Pinball Fantasy. So this came out ninety two on the Amiga. So already when this was poured over to the Jaguar, it was sort of dated. Yes. Uh, in a way, uh, the uh, it, there are very few samples, uh, like digitized samples, which admittedly the Jag strong suit is not uh, is not digitized sound or or, or that's sort of and there, of course the barrier for that is the fact that they went with cartridges. Right. And so, and much like the Nintendo 64, for example, uh, was did not go crazy with the digitized audio. It's because it took up too much space in the cartridge. Right. Um, so, in the first in the first board, uh, there there are some nice loops. There's there's a kind of a neat uh, uh, like a fun house sort of thing. There's a thing that looks like a Yoda head, which yeah. I've never quite understood what that was doing there. That's sort of I, 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 kind of out of place on that. Um, it plays like a standard pinball game. There are you know, there are rules. Uh, there, you know, you're to advance the machine. I mean, it's I, to me party parties has nothing special. I mean, in terms of these tables, I thought it was. I mean, it was literally the most average one, in my opinion. What'd you What'd you think of that one? Uh, I don't consider that the worst. Actually. No, I didn't think it was the worst. Oh, okay. I'm saying it's just the a, most average yeah. of the four. Okay, yeah, I'll give you that. Um. It, it it didn't have anything that was exciting. It didn't have anything that really drove the game. So yeah, I'll agree. Yeah, um, you'll notice also this game does have this 
particular table has no multi ball, well, and and it uh, you know that's it looks, a pretty common theme. It looks good now. Um, differences between this and the Amiga version. Um, the Amiga version doesn't look as colorful as this, uh, but this it's, runs. This has a, is a much. Uh, I don't say much slower, but it's it's it is definitely slower. slower, which is yeah. inconceivable if you consider yeah. this thing was built as a 64-bit uh, console, and the Amiga has <laughs> a 7.14 megahertz processor in it. That's inexcusable. Yeah. Uh, so, but overall, it's an okay machine. It's it's funny. I probably play this one the most. I, I, really? I, yeah. And I, I mean, wow. I don't know. It always pops up. I'm like, I'll give this one a shot. So I've played it quite a bit. But it's it's okay. You spell puke. I like that. Yeah. So it's pretty funny, <laughs> you know. And the sound effects are good. The music on all these tables is, is good. I think. Uh, I think this is probably the weakest sound effect wise. Well, it could they could have done more with the theme. That's yes. that's for sure. So the next one in in line is a is one called Speed Devils. This is one of your classic car based uh, pinball tables. Uh, this has a really interesting, this is probably the most interesting upper play field of all of them uh, when you shoot oh, the ball. Yeah. It's got a lot to do in the upper part of the, of the machine. There's a flipper up there as well. And uh, uh, there's a lot of little loops. And it's one you can, it, you can feel like you're advancing to us a lot further and a lot more quickly uh, it, than, than you do on, say, on the first one, party on the party one. The uh, uh, sound effects on this is good. They've got some of the car stuff to make yes. it sound like you're in a car. The, the the picture on it is uh, it's it's nice. I would say this is sort of like what like a getaway or something like that. Yeah, terms, certainly. You know, certainly uh, what they're uh, going for. And uh, it's a I, I enjoyed this one. Okay, My, I'm not really into the car theme that much, but uh, uh, you know, it's okay. I mean, you know, if you just look at it strictly from a playability standpoint, this was probably my second favorite to play. In terms of the actual playability of it, now this one, looking over some reviews and stuff, this is uh, probably the most popular table in the pack, and it is for arguably. Me as well. uh, what did you like about this? It? My favorite one by far. Uh, you can upgrade the car. You know, you can. Uh, uh, yeah, I like that. Uh, the uh, the the side lanes, the upper play field. Uh, this one has the most pinbally feel to me. Um, this one you could probably make a table out of. Yes, know. yeah. Uh, oh, and it would be expensive to put all that crap at the top. There'd be a lot, uh, a lot of ramps and spins. Uh, up it's there. not. It's not that. I mean, it's, look at and, it, and it, I will say the the spins, the rings at the top, the, the are tight. I mean, it, that's yeah. a, it's really that, and the flipper hangs at a very bizarre angle. It's a that's a weird. It's a weird. It's it's clever actually. It's pretty yeah. clever. Well, I mean, there are pinball machines that do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, this was. I like being able to try to advance. In my pinball machines, I like being able to advance. I mean, the score aspect, of whole, of course, is is king. Uh, but being able to advance your car, you know, to, to make the loops, to, it just had more. It had more of everything I like about pinball. Yeah, I, 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 like, I like this table okay. It's funny, though, because this is probably the one I play the least. So I, I, I'm more of a theme guy. I can't help myself. So I, I know. I know. <laughs> Playability. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just hey, I'm calling them like I see him. Again, uh, compared to the Amiga version, of course, uh, Pinball Fantasies came out on the PC as well. Which I, I've never played the PC version of it, but I, but uh, again, this this table looked fine. It was very similar to uh, had good. This one, in my opinion, the car revving noises. Uh, was really solid. You couldn't leave that out of this. Uh, no, but I mean, it, yeah, yeah and, and they did them well. Yeah, I agree. Um, yes. This is probably uh, from an audio standpoint. But this is probably this is my second favorite table in terms of playability. So, <clears throat> moving on is the billion dollar game show. Now, this game to me reminds me of a, of a table called No Fear in the arcade, which is a table that is pretty much effectively empty in the middle with a lot of upper shots. All right, and that's that's billion billion dollar game shows a lot like that. Um, <clears throat> what do I think with this table? This table suffers greatly from the lack of audio clips. Oh, uh, this I can if you could shovel in the Smash TV guy. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> You'll need it. And the guy they've got a picture of a billionaire game show host with these chicks right in the middle of it, and he just looks like you want to see this guy talk. Yes. I would almost even like to see one of those, like a Funhouse style head that would announce stuff. You know what I'm saying? That would be, I think that'd be cool. Uh, but that, of course, that was 
this <laughs> that came way later, past yeah. the capabilities so, of this machine. So, uh, in Billionaire Game Show, you're uh, in Billionaire Game Show. You play a contestant on a game show, and you're yep. trying to uh, advance the score to get prizes. And when you light certain loops, uh, you you can go for the prize. <clears throat> um, this one is sort of, like I said. If you're into that sort of open play field shot taking, you're okay. Now. I will say this about all these tables, uh, in terms of the way the pinball machine works in pinball fantasy, is it's a scrolling table. As the ball moves to the top of the table, it's you, the screen scrolls up, and as it moves down, it scrolls down. The scroll was okay; I didn't have any problems with that. It can be a little jakey, but it's not horrible. The problem with all, and I will say they've addressed this. I'll give the guys credit. The problem with the system like this is that it makes it tough if you're taking shots to the upper play field. Uh, unlike a real pinball machine where you can see the entire expanse and this right. you're not seeing where you're shooting the ball. But what they've done cleverly is in the makeup of the game, they have arrows on the board, just like you would have in a proper pinball machine, you know, lit and unlit arrows, that basically point you to exactly where you need to hit the ball. Right. So you can just use those to Aim guide for the you. arrows, not for the shot. Now, normally I'd be like, "What a, this is that's insane. But it actually works. It works pretty well. I, 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 was, I had no trouble... Um, you know, I had some trouble, but not as much as you'd think making shots. Uh, and but I mean, this table is compound. That problem is compounded. You have to make these shots that are a, a good piece from the from the flippers, and it's it's a long it's a long shot. Uh, but uh, I like I like the concept of this table, and I like the art package on the table. I like the, like I said, the game show guy looks right. cool. Uh, <clears throat> but this one. It's funny, in some ways, this is my favorite table. But like I said, I, because I like the concept, but in some ways, it's the probably least feature-filled table. This one does have a score. The one thing that's funny, the, the very first table uh, doesn't have a, doesn't award, doesn't award, and mo on the other three tables, you get a certain score, a bonus is awarded. The first doesn't do that, for whatever reason. Um, but the Big and Dark Game Show, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. It's more exciting. You're building the tension a little bit. You're trying to raise your, you know, your bonus to get those prizes. Uh, but I, I'm not a huge fan of the of those open play field machines. I want something in the middle. I mean, if you think about in in, pin, in the pinball world, obviously, if you can see behind us, we we both know a little bit about pinball. Um, <clears throat> to me, you've got a game like No Fear that's all upper shots. And then you've got a game like, um, uh, let's say, Monop Monopoly or something, where they put a they put a ramp square in the, in the middle of the early lower part of the playfield, and it always gets in my way. I don't like either one of those. I'm a happy medium guy. I want I want my toys and stuff somewhere in the middle upper area where I, I have a little bit of space to shoot the ball. This one I think is a little too far. Now I I, I hate this table. Uh, <laughs> I hate. Back. Open con I hate open field pinball machines. I prefer stuff in the middle. Uh, I mean, mm. our Who Done It smack dab in the middle. Yeah, but Who Done It? It's not. There's not stuff right at the bottom. I mean, uh, other games I've talked about. It's lower. The stuff's real uh, low. I, I like shots that are to the side. Firepower Two has the ramp shot that goes across the. You know, the ramp that goes across the table. Yeah. Um, when you have to send the ball up field every time i think it just slows down pinball and i don't like it and i think it translates exactly the same here i love the theme of this table uh yeah theme that the, the theme is a missed opportunity but I, I just i don't like the openness of it i i rarely rarely even load this table up when, when i'm flipping through tables this is usually the one i go like uh you know what i'm just gonna play uh, yeah Speed Devils again. You know, I, well, I mean, I can't, I can't uh, fight with you on that. Like I said, it's, it, I like the theme. It just seems like a missed opportunity. So, the last table uh, in the collection is called Stones and Bones. Now, the Pinball Dream series has this sort of uh, uh, weird fascination with kind of spooky tables, and they always include something in there. And this was this entry here with sp Stones and Bones. Now, uh, I will say that this is probably my favorite table. But you're, oh, I bet, I bet it's based ninety nine percent on the theme. Well, no, uh, there's a lot to like about this table. Now, hear me out. Uh, for starters, I, I'm a big fan of the central toy castle, where you, there's a there's a spinning ramp that goes up to a castle entry, which is cool looking. I also am a big fan 
And this is well done, I might add. In fact, this is well done through the whole game. Anytime in the game you have ramps that come across the play field, they've got them mm-hmm. shaded in a way to let you know that there's a ramp there. So it's not visually, it's not always that pleasing, but it, it lets you know that you you are that, that there's no uh, it's functional right there's no you're not worried that you're going to no. hit the ball into it because you know that's an elevated platform right this one has a very interesting uh, platform system on the left hand side of the screen the ramps are like uh, curved over and over and the ball mm-hmm. goes, switches lanes or whatever and so if it starts at, up at the top and one on the left the ball is going to come down and come down into the into the right. The flip the, the left flipper, and if it comes out, if it starts on the left, it goes. That's going to go into the vault, which is a kickback and a scoring bonus. I mean, you can't lose the ball there. That would be horrible. Right. And at the top of it, there's a there's a I think it's rip your spelling. Yeah. And you so it's got it's got a rollover. So I like that. I think it's really cool. I think the art is okay. The, I think the theme is fleshed out okay. This is another one that could have benefited from cooler sound effects. You know, in terms of like horror type sound effects. Uh, there's a big skull in the middle of the thing that I like. You know, I, I, I think it's a lot to like on this particular pinball machine. I like to hear why you don't like it. No, I, I do like it. It's my second favorite table. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I, I, I think the theming is not taking full advantage of it. I don't think it's horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like, like you, I like the left side of the table where it goes down. Uh, the advancement on this table isn't great but it's not horrible either i thought it was okay i mean i like the fact that you hit, once you advance it far enough and you hit and you hit that castle you get the big that's when you get right the big but points. yeah it's the payoff yeah um i think the sound on this is actually decent yeah it's I, probably I, the second best sound in. yes yeah yeah i agree um but the problem with this game for me is it's not as good as previous versions, in my opinion. How do you mean? I, I I think the Amiga did it better. You're talking about this game as a whole. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and when you're releasing something that far down the line, that many years apart, and you put no effort into improving the visuals, you put no effort into improving the sound, why even put it out? Well, I think at this point... Uh, I don't want to say that shovelware was coming, but this was a this was not the most difficult port. Clearly, they didn't put out any effort into it, really. No. Just to go oh, summarize, they took the um, they, t- they just took the sprites and shoved them into another. Well, card. I mean, the color they enhanced the colors, but I don't think so. They, I, mean, I, I think it looks it's, like, it looks it looks a little better, and also, of course, you've got uh, uh, you do. I mean, you still have the ability to play four people. You know, you've got that stuff still in there. I know, but I'm just saying it's there. And it's a pinball game on the Jag, which it didn't at the time. It, it, the only one other pinball game was ever released for the Jag, which is called Pinball Ruiner, which is a horrible name. And yeah. uh, uh, I've not played it. I've watched some footage of it being played, and it, it doesn't look any better to me. But uh, some people like it more, and some people don't. I think more traditional people probably don't. Uh, but uh, pinball. The problem with pinball fantasies, which I, you know, it's funny when we go back and look at these. I was more of a fan of pinball. Uh, dreams and I was pinball fantasies because I like the tables better. Yeah, that much said, there was a lot of advancement, but one thing that didn't advance in this, and this is the same on the Amiga, was that there's no multi ball, which that is That's, unbelievable to me. Uh, it didn't excuse it. And they me. didn't have it, wasn't on the Amiga. It's not like they removed it for the, no, for the Jag, it, it was never there. And I always thought to myself, That's how strange. Now, the that, Amiga, you could say, Well, maybe they couldn't, you know, get the physics right with the balls colliding, that kind of stuff, but. This is a modern, at the time, console. You've got to put that kind of stuff in. It's got to be there. Well, I will say this. There's no way you could have done a straight port of this and, by the way, add multiball because you'd have to rewrite the rules and, and whatnot. It just wouldn't work. I, you uh, could just have it whenever you complete the table's objective, it launches another ball. You know, it, it, none of that happens. You're right. <laughs> uh, it just, it, it does, that doesn't happen on, on this. Um, so what you're what you're looking at in, in, in its entirety is are the exact same thing as the Amiga except for slightly slower. I mean, it's not unplayably slower. No, but it's, it's just, why we that is a that is totally bizarre to me. And and I tried to find what what happened there, and I could not. I never heard. I, I that, think you're a programming right. perspective while they did it. My guess is they just poured Quick it over butt. and just never bothered to you know try to streamline it. But you know who knows. Now you know one thing we haven't mentioned. Yeah. Uh, 
it does use the number buttons on the controller. It does. To select the tables. It does. <laughs> I, well, I, you can, or to select four players. Yeah. You know, so yeah. That's okay. So, um, I looked at some reviews for this thing. Uh, and, you know, JAG reviews are not easy to come by. Um, so I just looked at what I could find. So the Atari Gaming Headquarters gave it a 40%. Oh. Ouch. Oh. Uh, just Claws JAG site gave it an 80%. Planet Atari, which is a, a German outfit, gave it seventy four percent. The Atari Times fifty percent, and the Video Game Critic gave it an eighty two percent. I don't. I wouldn't go. There's no way I'd say forty percent or fifty percent. I mean, if this is a listen. If this is a good game in terms of pinball. Uh, it's, but I mean, it's definitely for a, a sixty four bit system. You're talking, I would say, on the low end of a C, just because, just because it's it's in its current state. Yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't go any higher than that. On the Amiga, this was a, a pretty good title. Probably oh, a, a sure. B title. You know, but the difference is this is again a sixty four bit do the math system that costs two hundred and fifty bucks that came out in ninety three with the Amiga it cost you know, it cost more, but it came out in eighty five originally. Yeah. So you yeah. got there's a big gap there in terms of the of the quality of the game. So I had a look at this thing on eBay. Uh, just to see, because I, you know, it's funny. I paid mine. I just, in fact, I pulled the price tag off before I stuck it in the machine just now. My, I paid twenty bucks for this thing loose, um, and uh, it's been a couple years ago. Which so, is, I think, it's kind of crazy. I guess it's somewhat the rarity of the system. Well, you know, in my case, I had a, um, I had picked up a Super Video Out, uh, and I thought, you know, this is gonna look great with the with on pinball. I'm gonna give it a shot. Plus, I'm a big fan. I, what am I gonna say? I'm an Amiga guy yeah. too. So I picked it up, and it, it's uh, it's okay. Uh, on eBay, I saw these boxed. Uh, you're looking at sixty to fifty fillers, sixty, seventy bucks boxed. So you're, you know, wow. Mine wasn't boxed, so I'm going to say twenty bucks is probably about what you're looking at. Uh, so pinball fancies, you know, now not does, bad. Does that surprise you since the game was not an exclusive by any stretch of the imagination? Let me tell you something. Um, every game on the Jags is exclusive now in terms of pricing because well, I, because they're. Again, you're talking about a system that I mean, it, the the, the, most, the most popular game sold eighty thousand units. That's, if you think about it worldwide, that's not a huge uh, collection of you. That's that's the most popular game. Who knows what these lower so, echelon games? So you sold. think it, it's solely based on the rarity? Yeah, cause Jag stuff suddenly become collectible in the past five years. No one gave a crap about it before that, but it's it's. It's, it's it's just like everything else. It's just blowed up. Yeah. So what do you got this week, Brenner? Oh my. Well, let me tell you something. I <laughs> I understand why uh, John went on hiatus when he did because <laughs> Bubsby and the Fractured Furry Tales was a, was a trip down memory lane I could have done without. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> for those not in the know, uh, Bubsby was a claims attempt to make a mascot that was on par with Sonic, Mario. It was the it was the the thing to do at the time. Uh, his first game, uh, Bubsy came out. Bubsy is this wisecracking, uh, uh, pun throwing mascot. He runs as fast as Sonic. He jumps. He glides. Uh, has all the ear markings of what could have been a really successful mascot. Uh, his one-liners are cute the, the first time you hear them, and you can probably get a chuckle the second and third time. Uh, but in a video game where you hear it 40, 50, 60 times, uh, yeah, that grinds on you. <laughs> and, it, and, and the appeal wears off and it moves straight into hatred. Mm. So the first game came out, and it was rough. It was mostly one-hit kill, made him not fun made it so you you couldn't use the speed because you were so afraid of getting hit by an enemy you couldn't use the jump to it because there's a jump high jump with one button and a glide with the other button uh, throughout all these games and the high jump you kind of steered away from uh, except when you're making platform jumps because you're afraid you're going to jump into an enemy that was off screen or you scroll into it uh, but Busby 2 came out. They fixed some of those issues. They gave him three hits instead of one. Uh, they made his controls a little tighter. Uh, and then this being a, a, an exclusive that came out mere months after Busby 2 stepped back to the first game. One hit kills. 
Uh, so you're telling me Bubsy Two was out when this came out on the Jag? Yes. Yeah. It, <laughs> they were. Well, they were. This uh, two came out, and then I think it was two or three months later this came out for the Jaguar. Oh, God. As an exclusive, this uh, fractured furry tails, Atari Jaguar only. Um, but they stepped backwards. They had a different studio doing the titles, and they, uh, instead of having the hit points and kind of better controls, they were back on the first one, which was universally panned for being too difficult and no fun. And when you do that in a game and then make the levels three times larger, and make them puzzle based it's just a disaster and that's what this game is oh, from beginning to end disaster now it's kind of cute they they took fairy tales and in, made them into level design uh the first one was alice in wonderland the next set you get to is jack and the beanstalk uh, alibaba 20 leagues under the sea and then hansel and gretel mm. Now, here's what's a little confusing with all that, is um, your hero, Buffy, is killing these time-honored classic uh, heroes at the end of each level. Like, at the end of the Alice in Wonderland level, you kill the Mad Hatter. Uh, at the end of the game, you kill Hansel and Gretel. I mean, what sense does that make? But, uh, <clears throat> looking, not ignoring that for a moment... The graphics on the game are actually beautiful. They're nice. They're colorful. Uh, they're a little busy, but they're nice. The sound is not great. Uh, it's it's not horrible, uh, but it's certainly not what you would think of as a 64-bit soundtrack, in my opinion. Um, the digitized voices for his one-liners... Uh, they, they're clean, you can tell what he's saying, but man, what a horrible idea to make them say it every time he starts a new level. Or when you die and you restart the level, you get the same quip over and over again. The same little starting screen. Oh. Yeah, you get, that gets old. You want to get back into the action instantly. Oh my gosh, and you just... It, you hear it and he runs off screen and you're like, <clears throat> oh my gosh, I don't even want to play this anymore. Um, for me, I like difficult games. I like challenging games. But this, the level design in Fractured Furry Tales looks like someone had a level editor and they just put stuff places. <laughs> and it was, you've got floating platforms that make no sense. You've got uh, level design that makes absolutely no sense. Every level is a maze. And you have to hit check, or you have to hit switches to advance to the end um and in a game where you have one hit kills fall damage fall damage in a platform game <laughs> yeah. it's just it's mind-boggling <clears throat> and when every single thing he can't get in water he can't get hit by uh any character he any in a, any sprite he runs into kills him droplets of chocolate on one of the levels kill instant death and it, it, that's the kind of game design where you, you you step back and you wonder did anyone test this and say am i having fun yeah. because I, I did not have fun <clears throat> i uh for, in the interest of full disclosure i could not get out the first level of this oh uh -huh. don't feel bad i only barely beat the first level i uh <clears throat> now I did password my way through the whole game. When this, when this, when this game got picked, I had heard of it, and I the reason I'd heard of it is because Bubsy as a character is sort of reviled in a weird way. <laughs> he always has his own hate hate base. He's I mean he's the classic attitude poochy style guy. He's got the explanation explanation uh, point on his on his shirt, you know, uh, which is which is uh, you know come on. Exclamation point on your shirt, and and you're an attitude guy. It's just like, and and, and they they push the exclamation point everywhere. It's in the opening. It's, it's all around. the collectibles <clears throat> have it on it. Yeah. The uh, we've played a lot of platform games over over the years, and this is one of your classic 
uh, not d- designed by someone who's not that good. Um, exactly. The uh, the graphics, while colorful and interesting, are um, distracting. They've got things that are in the foreground that you think you can jump on but can't. <clears throat> I'd say chairs, for example. The fact there are two different ways to jump is idiotic. The, uh, the, 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 you're doing, I hope you like blind jumps. Why can a cat fly? There's another one I'd like to ask. Why does a cat get killed by a bunny? Because I can tell you that cats, that, I mean, this guy's like a bobcat or something. Yes. Bobcats are vicious. I just saw in the news a guy got killed by a bobcat, yeah. right? So, but see, that mm. bobcat wasn't wearing an exclamation point. Well, yeah, you think sure. if you had an exclamation point, you'd have like Wolverine claws <laughs> and Dracula fangs. You know, bruh. Uh, I like the opening. The I, the first time I saw the first level called "Go Ask Alice," which is a play on the old uh, Jefferson Airplane song. <laughs> I thought, "Oh, hey, that's pretty good." And then I played the level. I was like, "That looks okay." And then I got killed. One hit kills. The, how that? No, just, just in a game like this, you yeah. This isn't minor twenty forty nine or man. You need this is you know. There's a lot of pers- uh, listen. That part of this is. The Jags controller is not the best, all right, in terms of like pinpoint accurate jumps. Oh, no. And this one, yeah. you have to have uh, pretty good jumping. <clears throat> yeah. Now, the first level, again, I didn't get past it, but you roll across the screen till you get to this like large spiked wall, right? And then you have to, cause then you realize you have to go up, all right? So there are two things right there that I hate. Number one, just these idiotic. There's a no explanation in the game for this wall. It's there strictly for. It just looks stupid. Well, that's the switches. <clears throat> yeah, I don't like that. And secondly, uh, they, you're jumping up into the air over these uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland like tea party motif, and up in the air are just are floating tea yeah. party tables. They're the exact same one that are on the ground. So it looks like somebody just said cut and paste here, here, here. You can jump from here. I mean, there's a there, there's a there's a method to it, but it's a stupid method. Oh, no, no um, it, it's, yeah. This, it's not random. They were put there on purpose, but putting there on purpose was a wrong choice. Yeah, this, the switch aspect is, it's so low-key. I didn't even know there was a switch for the longest time. <laughs> Did you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I knew. I, I knew. And, and so, and I like, how do I activate this? What does it do? I had no idea what was going on. You know, it, it wasn't apparent. The first level was way too hard. Yeah. Um. In in this game, and again, coming from the Amiga, where I'm used to the first level being pretty hard, this is this would fit right in, buddy. You slide yes. it right in. It was just too freaking hard. Even stuff, even games on the system with like Zool, which I, I've got Zool uh, two for the for the Jag, and I was not the biggest fan of Zool two, but Zool two, and I, I was not a big fan of the collectibles in it. I was not a big fan of the level structure, Zul 2 is way better than this. And, and that's not good. <laughs> Why is there things I can't collect sometimes? I couldn't figure that out. Uh, there, were, there were like floating uh, exclamation points I couldn't pick. I don't know what they even did. Those were checkpoints. No, no, I don't mean the big one. I mean, just mean like little ones. Like, you know how they had some like balls? I don't know what they were for. I had no idea what was going on there. The enemies, I mean, like in the first level, you've got uh, these... Uh, I guess they're pink flamingos or something with mohawks. With mohawks and you've yeah. got, like I said, you've got the aforementioned bunny. You've got Tweedledee and Tweedledum show up. But that that was pretty much as far as I got. You got the the snake throwing eggs. Uh, yeah. Uh, you got the uh, playing cards. I, I watched, thought the enemy design was actually really good. I watched some videos of this just to see what I was missing, and it's more of the. It looks just like more of the same. Yeah. Level wise, as you go, uh, Bubsy is not a. He's not an endearing character. No, no, he's not. Uh, he reminds me. We we did a game where they had that the main main character was sort of a bully caveman, and it was uh, this guy's number. He's still this guy's Bubsy's not that unlike. Well, he's <laughs> he's near that guy, and that was a much better game uh, than this. Uh, overall, man, I you know normally I don't get on here and kill a game because I, I've liked most of the games we play, you know. But man, this one was a, just a dud. I didn't like it. It's funny that we, you know, we've played mostly not that modern. This is as far forward in time as, as we've tackled on here. Uh, I think I'm trying to think when the Virtual Boy came out. It was right in that same area. But uh, th- these games were th- this particular game w- infuriated me more than I think any game I've played on ARG. I didn't like it. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, and I and, and you pretty much 
fit in with what everyone else felt about the game. Um, edited the uh, reviews on it were actually not as horrible as I thought they would be. That's that's done. Uh, Electronic Gaming Monthly gave it a, a 6.4 out of 10. Um, Atari Times gave it 70%, but of course, you know, I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people mentioned uh, Zool 2 in their review. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of pen- people mentioned, like, this is a step backwards for the series. Why is this here? Uh, why is the camera focusing on you in the center of the screen? I, you know, so you, you have even less reaction time. You could, I will say, it, in, its, in its defense, you could look up and down, That was which that helps. You could, you know, what I'm saying you could you could scroll the screen up a little bit or down a little bit, but not enough. But you could. I, I like games to do that. Well, but the thing is, is if you put the camera on the back part of the screen, you know, you don't have to do that. Oh yeah, I understand. But of course, the reason why it's in the center is because it has you going back and forth so much. Yeah. The camera swing would be nauseating. Yeah. Uh, this sold about fifty thousand copies. So it was one of the bigger sellers, yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, there you go. <laughs> That's on, how desperate they were. I will say, this looks more like a 64-bit title than Pinball. Oh, yes, sir. But it still doesn't look like... A, I mean, it, this could have you could have stuck this on the Super Nintendo without any thought. I don't think... I mean, they could have, um, I don't think there was anything on here that the Super Nintendo couldn't pull off. There might have been... Mm, it would have been close. I think it, I think it would have been close, color palette-wise. Um... The eBay price for this, for a, for an exclusive to the system, but I guess there's a lot more copies floating around out there. Uh, Sixty bucks boxed seems to be the going so rate. About, about the same as pinball fans. Uh, yeah. The box itself can sometimes go up for ten bucks. Hmm. Um, which the box art is, I don't know. It's okay, I guess. It's better than pinball fantasy's box art. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but Fractured Furry Tales, it's definitely not going to be one I'm, I'm going to go back and play again. I concur. In fact, if I never play it again, it'll be too soon. That's it. So, normally at this point, we'd spin the wheel and make the deal. But well, this... I I have a request. All right. Since you have made me play uh, Fractured Furry Tales, I would like I would like my, my just do to pick a system for next week. Okay, fair I know it, I know it's not a spin the wheel, but I feel as if I'm owed this for having to set in on uh, uh, on Buck's choice. Yes, that's fair enough. So next week it'll be Brent's the, choice. What it, are we doing? We are going to do the family computer disc system. Mm, okay, better better known as the Famcom disc system. You know, I uh, I've just recently. Uh, had it started looking at those games, and there's there was a ton of them. I was there, surprised. There was quite a few. There's a decent library out there. So we're going to spotlight the Famicom Disk System next week. That's it. Yeah. Um, 